Okay, welcome to the Coaching Hub. This is uh, a new series of in-depth interviews with world-class coaches. And it's also an attempt to try and apply some academic theory and to talk about some of the academic work being done by staff here at Cardiff Met in the School of Sport and Health Sciences. And then talk to coaches about how they might apply some of those theories out in the field. So joining me now is a, a truly world-class coach, an Olympic gold medal winning Coach uh, Gareth Baber, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. We're going to talk about the Olympics later, but we want mm-hmm. to talk about the start of your coaching journey first. Mm-hmm. Well, when you were a young player mm-hmm. um, and a professional player, what sort of coaches did you respond best to? What sort of coaches did you prefer playing under? Uh, look, it was only obviously personal to me, but I think those very much took an interest in, in me. Uh, not that it was egotistical in any way, but certainly... I felt probably the relationship with the likes of my father who who, who drove me um, despite having some difficulties with his own health. There was the sort of people who gave up uh, a little bit, uh, wanted to get an interest in me, but not not in an end in itself in terms of outcomes and, and performance, but literally, you know, that, that, that was part of the process was building relationships with me with the view that, that one day, you know, I would, I would reciprocate with that and release that potential for, for what they were coaching. And... I think that you know, there's one probably that does stand out in my mind was a gentleman called Alec Evans when I was playing at Cardiff. Alec was one of the first, um, certainly at that sort of professional era, who really had an interest in me outside of just what was happening on a rugby field, you know, what was happening in my life, where I was, a, I was gauging my intentions of where I wanted to end up, you know, and I was studying at the same time and giving me space to do that, and you know, I felt that that sort of that sort of relationship that we had. Um, you know, certainly motivated me to 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 you know try and be the best player I possibly could. Um, equally, there was a there was a coach who, when I was in primary school up in Lisvania in Cardiff, um, he was dedicated a dedicated rugby uh, coach and 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 really you know was about driving that talent and slightly different to Alex. It was it was more about adding to us technically and tactically and enjoying that whole concept of being in a team environment. The teaming bit of it being hugely important, you know, the camaraderie, the reason why I always wanted to play team sports was because I enjoy being with people and I enjoy the challenges that you have together as people and that sort of continued in through through my coaching and um, you know, I suppose more latterly uh, working with the likes of uh, Lee Jones and, and Di Reese, um, you know, both here in Wales and then overseas in, in Hong Kong. Um, you know, their, their, their intelligence, their smarts around the game, um, I've witnessed their development as coaches as well as the same time as mine. And, um, you know, the, 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 the ego doesn't play that part in, in, in the way that they are as coaches. And I think that, you know, if you're, you have that ability to relate to others, you know, build rapport and relationships with others and, have that perspective from a coaching perspective and that's where the individual can go that's the sort of people that I've responded to and the sort of people I probably gravitate to um, from a mentoring position but also who I like to surround myself with as well when it comes to 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 putting a program together so in your playing career when was it you you made that decision I want to be a coach and I know you did your level four here at Cardiff Met but was there a certain point where you started thinking differently as a player and thinking about the next step I think that probably you know as I as I came to the later years of my of my playing career you know I think that I became more and more uh, aware of where I sat in it um, you know I wasn't a young buck anymore trying to prove himself it was more about what I could help with others um, it was more around um, right at the end of the career with Welsh sevens and 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 sort of at the Dragons there was a lot of young players coming in and, and I could see that I had probably a, a, a personality which which was able to transfer the information that I had on to others. Um, and I was able to combine people in a group environment as well, you know, just part of the personality development, I think, that I was having at that point. And that's probably where the first seeds of it came up. I never saw myself as a coach. Again, I'll go back, Lee Jones was the first one who said to me, have you thought about coaching? And I was like, I'm not sure. At the, the time, I, I was, you know, my studies, I was going to go and work on in the transport industry is where I'd done my master's degree and I thought that was where I was destined and I was doing some part-time work. Then I got into that sort of coaching of, of, of under 18s, under 20s and that sort of led to the Welsh Sevens and and then really probably my academia kicked in um, and my background in, in, in university life and I thought, hang on a minute, you know, 
I can piece some of this together now and I can see where some of those things, that sort of tacit knowledge you get as you develop as a, as a player, as a coach, fits in in terms of the academic work that's being done. And that was sort of the jump then that I thought, right, I've got to give this a go. And you know, fortunately, I had the back end of the family and things, and my wife particularly, even three kids, and it's like, okay, well, go and be a coach. Do you apply academic theory to your coaching, to your decisions? Yes, yes, you do. I, probably not in a, in, a, in a strictly formal sense. I still like to have conversations uh, with with knowledgeable academics who who obviously theorise about uh, the systems you would operate and are able like that to be able to pinpoint where it sits in all of in that theory. Um, that but, management theory as well. Yeah, management theory. theory, culture of groups, leadership. Um, you know, uh, rapport building. Um, you know, language use. Uh, you know, it, above and beyond the sports science in relation to the likes of GPS and work that you would do operationally. It's probably that 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 element of the softer side of coaching, which you know certainly has developed me as a coach. And when I think about my development, it's not necessarily right. I tick that. I tick that. It's now being in the moment of being a coach and being able to call on experiences and link them to that academia. I, I've never been in a position where I got right, that, that's there, that sits in organisational culture or that sits in leadership. It is almost you're moving between the very many different roles that you have as a coach and I think that you know having an understanding of that from an academic perspective certainly backs up and gives a balance to, to the way that I coach. We'll tap into some academic theory a, a bit later but in terms of your coaching journey so far, You've coached regional rugby, club rugby, international rugby, sevens and fifteens. Um, which has had the most impact on your development so far? Would it be your time at the Blues, your time in Hong Kong, your time with Fiji? What's impacted you the most, and in what different ways? I think you know, obviously when you you, know, you you look back, and it is a journey, and, and even though it's a high profile of profile teams that pe- people would tend to look at in those pressurised situations. You know, wherever you are coaching, you still it depends on where your personality development is at that time, and and how you have a perspective on your own coaching is right. Where, what does this what does this offer as a challenge, but an opportunity in developing myself? And I think that all of the above uh, have provided that. And even my playing, I now look back as myself as a player, having been in those environments. And you know, I didn't play 15s for Wales, and I would love to, but you know, there were some great players around at that time. And I would have liked to have had that experience because, again, I think that would have given me, you know, an element of of, of the coaching which I probably have, have 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 not had. But equally, I can I can offer that as an opportunity. I didn't have that, so I've got to go in search of it. And I think that, you know, obviously the latest one going, you know, with Fiji and going to the Olympics, there was a challenge, many different challenges, you know, over a four and a half year period. It had quite a, you know, a, a crucial part in the lives of not just myself but my family mm. and, and ultimately the nation of Fiji as well which you know everybody is, is cognizant of is, is you know a massive lover of rugby and particularly rugby sevens and it comes from the history and tradition they have there so I think that you know you gain experiences from, from all of the above certainly from the Cardiff Blues my early uh, work in the Blues and working with people like Dai Young you know good knowledgeable tough operator when it comes to coaching and that certainly developed me as a coach and then that prepares you then probably later down the line for different challenges like those challenges we'll probably talk a little bit about with with Fiji uh, cultural personal but obviously in terms of the coaching process as well yeah we're going to get to to Fiji but when you talk to younger coaches do you advise them to travel like you have and to experience you know going to Hong Kong going to Fiji what does that give to a coach Getting out of Wales in some ways, you know, leaving your comfort zone. How much has that given you, and is that something you would recommend other coaches do? <clears throat> well, yeah, getting out of comfort zone is a big is a big element to coaching. I mean, you can't be in coaching and and seeking comfort all the time because you know that's where mediocrity breeds. And um, I think that you know it's nice to be in those positions. And a lot of friends have always asked me, how do you deal with the insecurity of it? It was the same as a player. Um, you know, I haven't really moved on mm. in terms of that thinking. Um, but I think that you know, putting yourself, um, you know, th- th- there's a big part in leadership and coaching about that risk element, about personal risk, and what drives you and motivates you. And 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 and, and somewhere in the background there, I can see that running for me. Um, I don't like the fact that it runs for my wife, my mm. my kids, but you know, in some respects, they're having that experience as well. And you know, ultimately, you know, I, I believe they'll benefit from that, and we believe we'll benefit from that as well. And I couldn't have done the things in Hong Kong and Fiji if if I didn't have that backup. 
But I believe also going out of going out of Wales, going out of the UK, um, going to different cultures, um, challenging yourself, you know, first and foremost as a person, uh, but equally how that then knocks on to being a coach is is hugely important in getting perspective. Um, and you know, the best coaches are, in my opinion, only are the ones that can move between the different roles that they have to play in a coaching environment but particularly have that overall view and perspective of of where it sort of fits together and particularly when it comes to the development of those very individual and and and, and very different uh, personalities that you have in a, in a rugby team which is why we play and get involved in team sports in the first place because we are all different yet the coaching conundrum is how do you put all these people together in alignment um, and what are the component parts of that which breed, you know, a performance uh, which you would deem as successful? You talk about the best coaches. Who are those people for you now that you look around? They can be from other sports, and you admire the way they carry themselves or the things they say. Have you got certain coaches that you model yourself on, or that you are always keeping an eye on? Yeah, you, you know, I mean, obviously you look around. I think that you know any of the All Blacks coaches that you look, the, the, the system seems to keep producing them time and time again, and. Um, you know, I know you've got you know phenomenal talent there, but a lot of what's driven in the international rugby game, you know, a lot of it does come out of New Zealand because there's a lot of resourcing and there's a mm. lot of good coaching going on, and a lot of those get exported. And they um, say, yeah, they send a lot of their coaches absolutely. to Wales as yeah. part of their journey, which I believe is quite enlightened in terms mm. of that journey, that perspective, that la- you know, getting out of comfort zone. I think is a huge part of then finding yourself as a coach and understanding, you know, relying on yourself personally. Um, do you look at um, Pep Guardiola's and Jurgen Klopp's and, and, yep. and what they do? Yeah, massive Liverpool fans. So, uh, you know, what Klopp does, I think, is, uh, and Guardiola has done, you know, obviously read books like the, the Barcelona Way, which obviously Pep was massively part of. You know, it's very simple things that, but it's, it's you know, in both of those cases, it to me, strikes me, it's about relationship building. It's about, and I don't mean relationship building for the sake of it, but to, to release potential. Um, and they have their different ways about going about it, but even you can even hear it in their in their press conferences, conferences and their connections with the media that you know that's what they're after all the time, and I think that's why they hold so much respect. Um, you know, I, I've got to say from from a perspective here in Wales, what Warren Gatland has done in Wales, and what always I've always been reminded of, and I find remarkable is those those players that were I was coaching or were being playing in Wales at the time who were going in to be coached by Rob and 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 and, and Warren and Sean and, and Rob McBride and Neil, you know, they were taking players who were probably, you know, at, at that, you know, playing sixty five, seventy percent of the quality that they could play. When they played international rugby, you know, they were they they understood the system. They were enculturated into that system when they went in. They knew their role, there was clarity about what they were doing and they, and they delivered and no, that doesn't just come because somebody tells you to do it. It becomes because of what's put around you, um, and and the learning process that you go through as a player. And I think that you know, you know, I look at that and I think, wow, that wasn't that wasn't two or three years. That was that was twelve, fifteen years mm. that they were doing yeah. that for. And and that's a remarkable um, situation to be in, you know, and put that in. But yeah, again, you know, I would I would look at, you know, you've got coaches who are unbelievably proficient technically and tactically. Um, but ultimately, as well, I think that you know when you're talking about a growth of a team, and probably where I've just come for it from, you know, is is relating it to other people who base it around, uh, you know, creating a culture around a group of people that can go and do special things. And you mentioned then coaching teams like the one Gatland assembled. And as a rugby fan, we know all about his coaching team now, and we know who's accountable for defence and Sean Edwards or attack. Do you personally like being part of a team or in charge? So Back when you were at the Blues, you're part of a two-man coaching team with Justin Bunnell, sort of we called it sort of good cop, bad cop, yeah, a bit yeah. like um, the Chief McIntosh I don't, I don't and Tom Z. Who's, that, who's who in that one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you have him gone for a, a number one role at Fiji? You're going to go to Edinburgh and be part of a coaching team. What do you prefer? And, and is that going to be a struggle for you to be part of a team having just been in charge? Um, no, I don't think it's going to be a struggle. Um, you know, I, I like I like the interaction that we get as as as, as larger coaching groups. It's a team effort. Yeah, yeah. And, and and as you said, I come back to it. I I came into the game because it was about team, um, and you know, part of massive part of my self leadership leadership generally is is knowing when to lead, knowing when to follow, and 
I think that you know, okay, you can be a long time chasing the, the top jobs everywhere, but you know, people aren't dull in, in rugby environments. They know whether you can or you can't, and they also know if you're prepared to be put in that position and, and really understand what it is the role you're attaining for that group of people. And that's what I'm looking forward to. I've had seven years of 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 driving a program and leading that program. Um, I want to take concepts of that leadership, con concepts of what that was done in that coaching, and now see how I put them back into a team. And again, it's all gaining knowledge. And you know, I'm fortunate, you know, that I will be going up to Edinburgh and, and being part of that. And I'm looking forward to, you know, the, the 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 creativity and innovation that goes with a young group of coaches who are wanting to get on and and um, you know, ultimately, you know, a different environment as well than I've been used to. So, um, yeah, look, I think that at one stage, at some stage, you know, I would like to be in that. position position where you're molding the whole group but that's not my point now I, 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 can, I can clearly see that I've done some good stuff I've enjoyed doing what I've done but I've still got stuff to learn and being the car I want to be the best coach I can possibly be and where that takes me uh, ultimately is going to be about how receptive I am to going into those positions and learning and keep moving. You mentioned top jobs in rugby um, us sort of rugby romantics would see coaching Fiji as one of the top jobs in rugby how did that come about? Are you recruited? Is there a job advert? Is it on LinkedIn? Does someone tap you up? How do you uh, get that job? Yeah, as simple as LinkedIn. Very basically, you know, the the 2016 Olympics had, had had come to an end, and obviously you're aware of it in the sevens environment. I was working in Hong Kong at the time, um, and I'd been there for three, three and a bit years, and. Um, there was adverts coming up, and you sort of get onto them, and I applied for two or three of them at the time, and. Uh, didn't get offers of, of interviews from the other ones, but I got one from Fiji, and I thought, right, well, you're going you're to go and pursue that because you know, uh, what fool's going to employ a Welshman to coach Fiji? But um, and I went through the process, and you know, ultimately convinced them that you know there was something in the way that I did things and what I could see for Fiji, which which could be of benefit. And you know, again, you know, you don't know. It's like anybody going into a job; you're not quite clear on how you're going to make that happen. But what I do know about coaching, it is about you know being in the moment. It's about backing yourself to not just on a field in crucial moments, but backing yourself that you're going to be able to adapt and move and flex and and work with a group of people that you might not have worked with before. And backing yourself as a human being that you can make those connections. And that was never more tested than probably in Fiji for very many different reasons. So you had to take over from Ben Ryan, who'd won. Yeah. Uh, the 2016 Olympic gold. How did you deal with that pressure, and also just the pressure of it being Fiji's national sport, and having probably at sort of read in Fiji, you have to deal with hmm. the politics, hmm. the presidents, the king. You know, um, it means everything. So, how did you personally deal with that pressure, as <coughs> expectation? Um, it's it, it was tough. Uh, certainly, the first nine months I was there on, on my own. My family stayed in Hong Kong to finish the school year. Uh, we felt that was important, obviously, to give them the best start again than when they came to Fiji. Um, and, you know, probably inevitably what you tend to do is throw yourself into work. Um, you know, like a lot of us do is, you know, when the pressure comes on, you, you, you do that. But, you know, I, I, you know, as a player, I could see, pretend, you know, there was lots of other players, you know, as a, I was around the time of you know, playing with the likes of Martin Williams and, you know, Sam Warburton. I saw what they went through and I saw how they handled it, so how they developed as individuals. And you know, how their personalities developed. And I think that becomes a little bit of a model of, of how you can move through that. Um, you know, I do believe both of those individuals are very authentic in the way that they go about it. They don't come across as false. And I never wanted that to be for me either. Um, but there is, as you said, there is a scrutiny and expectation around uh, the head coach of the Fiji Sevens um, on the islands of Fiji. And, and that comes from a long rich history of success at, at sevens level but more than that it it, it, it it its roots are very much deep set in in the social fabric of Fiji um, in relation to you know like we would have done years ago years ago at a school fete or a community raising of money for a church um, there's sevens tournaments every weekend because of that and that's how it happens so the whole connection with sevens is is is, is in the islands constantly but obviously then that gets exported in relation to the international team going off and doing things that 
Um, you know, no, nothing else in Fiji can really be represented at that level, apart from bringing tourists in to, to have, you know, lovely holiday destinations and the like. So I was aware of all that. Um, you know, it does take you a little bit of a surprise, your notoriety, you know, people know who you are. Did you chat to Ben Ryan? Super- I did chat to Ben a little bit at the beginning. Um, and Ben gave me some good solid advice in relation to a, you know, a couple of individuals that I needed around me when I first got there um, about possibly where to live and, and you know, how to, to deal with some of that. But again, it's one of those experiential things. You're not going to know it until you're in the middle of it. And, um, you know, it, it, it taught me a lot about myself, um, you know, not in a, in a glib sort of way, but it does because, you know, you, you're trying to do your best for a country and, you know, the reflection on the field is not what they see, but you, you've got to stick to your plan to get where you need to. There was lots of things going on around that time, mm-hmm. which is quite normal in Fiji, yeah. um, which tends to distract and take attention away from, you know, as a, as a professional, you're like, right, we've got to go this way. And, and all of a sudden that they, you know, that's getting split apart. But again, you, 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 you develop more in terms of your personality development and, and you know, it leads you on to, to being a better coach. And we want to ask you about role theory. Uh, did you have to sort of adapt to persona when you arrived? Did they know much about you? And to what extent did your coaching style, as it was then in 2016, have to adapt to suit the Fijian style? Yes, I mean, you know, obviously when you go into, you know, they, did, they knew very little about me. I've been coaching Hong Kong and Hong Kong hadn't been playing against Fiji at that stage. They knew I had a background from Wales. Uh, I'd been an international coach in Wales and a player. Um, and they knew I'd coach 15s, but really it sort of stopped there. Um, and when I when I got there, I mean, there's you know the cultural differences became very evident very quickly. I mean, Fiji is based on hierarchical society throughout the villages. Um, there is a chief and the chief's uh, assistants, uh, underlings, and then the information gets passed down. So very much you're held at this parental chief figure. Um, as as the coach and and you know you're referred to as coach wherever you go a bit sort of like American we don't do it so much here there is there is a respect around that position that you you have and ultimately there's an expectation on the role you play and that role is 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 very much around being quite um, autocratic and direct um, and and that's not my way. Um, you're not a disciplinarian, or well, well, I, y- yes and no. I mean, obviously, you know, it's about creation of standards and creation of behaviours that, that conform to those standards. And I think that you know that's the bit that had to get through initially. Um, it, it's not about you know I, uh, you can't talk to me. It's about as I alluded to earlier. It's about building relationships and you know getting on to players and start having those conversations. They were a little bit taken aback, but that that's the way that I was going at it. Um, and and you know taking them through a process. I'm a big believer, <clears throat> as we said about those coaches who have engaged me. I'm a big believer in the process that the individual goes through, and I'm believing um, you know that that transformative approach rather than just giving them that information transactionally. That you know you're you're with them on the journey, and I think that you know I could always see that for four years. However, life in Fiji is very short term, planning is very short term. Um, life in the village is very short term. You get up in the morning wondering what you're gonna have for breakfast and scrabbling around what you're gonna have for lunch, farm, play a bit of rugby in the evening, and then you're then finding out what's, what's for dinner. What happens on Tuesday, Wednesday is about Tuesday and Wednesday's fault. What's happening in two weeks and a month is is completely out of out of the range of that strategizing. So. You know, I was in that mold, whereas they were just about, right, get us ready, play this tournament, then then we come home, we fall asleep for two weeks, and then we go again. And sort of building on that was a process that I had to establish, which was difficult initially, because they just wanted, I, well, I felt my opinion, my view of the world at that stage, they just want me to deliver, get away from them, bring them back together, deliver, get away from them. And, and that wasn't what I was used to, and it wasn't what I was used to as a player in the way that I, I perceive gaining consistency in performance has to come from a consistency in the way in you intend to train and that was one of the biggest challenges is getting that through and my role in all that um, and the role of 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 my coaches as well was system was hugely important in getting right to balance the, the the cultural aspects of being Fijian alongside what 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 my drive was in terms of gaining consistency for the ultimately win a gold medal because whether I liked it or not, 
for four and a half years, that's what I hear. We've got to go and win a gold medal. We've got to win a gold medal. That was the clear goal. Oh, that, that was clear. Yeah. That was when they yeah. hired you, did they say? Yep, absolutely, yeah. It was win every tournament you yeah. played in, but ultimately you're here to win a gold medal. And, you know, that, that they, they recognise, I mean, there's, it's bigger above my pay grade, but they recognise the, the enormity for Fiji of being able to do that. And it gets lost possibly in the rest of the world, but ultimately when you're in that situation, the role that you are in, morphing between and flexing between the media and you know your, your your stakeholders and then the players themselves and your coaching staff and you know all of those things then get really um, scrutinized but ultimately you know you, you learn very quickly on how you you have to adapt and make sure that you're, you're ahead of all that a quick question when you we know you're going to do a bit of work with Mark Lowther on leadership um, so you had to name captains and you talk about that hierarchical structure in Fijian society is that the same within the teams how important was the naming of captains or senior leadership groups and what do you look for in a captain and has that changed uh, yeah I think there's, there, there's there's different forms of captains I think that I had different forms of captains when I was when I was playing um, you know there was some captains who would, who would, who would lead by deed um, there were some captains who would lead by behaviours in and around training and accountability. Um, there were some captains who were very much at the forefront of the ta- tactical element of the game. So I think that, you know, all of the above that you're looking at, but above all is, is you know, it's, it's no secret that you look at the attitude of somebody to lead, but ultimately how they are with others as well and, and how they influence, how they carry influence with a group. Um, and, and probably in Fiji, I came in, the, the captain was Osir Kalinisau, who had been the captain through the previous uh, regime and, 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 and the captain of the Olympics. And he, he, was, he was sensational as a captain. He, he, you know, he had the players in the palm of his hand. He represented them well. Um, he was a quality player and his attitude was all about you know, the betterment of others and, and, and that selflessness that comes with, with being a leader, but was front and centre whenever it needed to be. Um, and, and, you know, I knew I was going to lose him at some stage, which was tough because it was then there was no real clear leaders that came behind that. Um, and ultimately, right after that, I remember having the conversation, Jerry Tuai was probably the most experienced. There's one or two others, but he was one I saw going through to the Olympics where I could see two or three others possibly weren't. And, and it didn't work. The leadership bit didn't work for Jerry. Um, he is probably one of the most selfless people I've ever met. I mean, you know, and it's, it is no joke. He, he get, we don't get gold medals in, this, in the Olympics. He got a gold medal, the tw- 13 players, and he gave me his gold medal and insisted I had it. And I said, no, Jerry, I'm not having that. And he insisted, insisted. In the end, I had to put it back in his bag to go. That's the sort of level, and that's not, that's not show. There was nobody else involved in it. I'm the one who said that. There was nobody else involved in it. And it just goes to show you that, that that's the sort of character. And I, I wanted that in the team. It's very Fijian. Mm. Um, it's very much around, um, you know, he would always do things, um, you know, on a field that people didn't want to do. And as a smaller man, and also being one of the best players in the world helps, mm. but as a smaller man, he could do things that people just went, wow. And, you know, that, that, that's the sort of leadership that you get in terms of deed. But it didn't work. So there was two or three other captains that came through, and one of them was a military officer who was very, uh, who is now peacekeeping, didn't make the Olympics because he went to do peacekeeping in the Middle East. That's the sort of thing that goes on. Um, uh, Paolo Dranasinicola, and he, he was about quiet, authority, physical, deliver. And we needed that at that point. You know, and, and so I think, you know, again, I, I don't know what really what exactly what I'm looking at in a captain. I know what the leadership qualities are that I look for in a group. I, I like collaboration when it comes to getting that information across across the group. Ultimately, you've got to have a leader. But funnily enough, what happened then is eventually when Paolo went and there's another gentleman called Kelly Nasoko who was in there in that time as well. Jerry came back and at that stage, Jerry had moved in the space of four years to a point in his personality development, which was now, right, I'm ready to lead now, I'm ready to take this on as a captain. And, and that was particularly powerful, one for me, but two for the group as well. And, and you know, ultimately, he's a double gold medalist in rugby and you know, he was captain of his country when he did it. That's fascinating. Uh, you mentioned um, the importance of collaboration and a collaborative approach. That takes us to our next theory. Um, Dr. Kevin Morgan here at Cardiff Met has looked at this uh, theory of collaborative creativity. And this idea, and it feels like it really fits with Fiji, that um, you want to give them freedom to improvise, but it has to be within a structure. 
And lots of us on the outside would think, how do you coach the Fijians? They've got all this natural flair and skill, but how do you ensure they have some discipline to their players as well? Yeah, a... Uh, Without yeah. stifling the creativity. Yeah, and that was always the case. Part of the you know the vision that sort of we put together as a staff was to ensure that we kept playing as as a group of Fijian men and representing the, you know the way that the game is played across Fiji and the skill, athleticism, faith culture of of what Fiji has. And it's very easy to say that because ultimately, as a coach, as you say, you've got to put some sort of parameters around. Um, the way that they operate, but particularly, you know, in those crucial moments on a rugby field. So there was there was um, there, w- there were three or four mechanisms that we use. One of the big mechanisms is is keep them playing, mm-hmm. keep them keep them used to playing, uh, you know, mini small sided games that that emphasize and 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 uh, remind them exactly how they play the game, um, alongside some. Uh, some scenario based activities which are more about solving problems together and slowing game down but probably the biggest elements that w- we tended to use were more about mental skills and uh, them understanding that that you know it is okay their, their attitude to risk it is okay guys you know um, there is a little bit of the faith uh, situation that builds into that because it's God's will. So um, you know, if you win or lose, it's not in your hands; it's God's will. And 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 then bringing players back to the understanding of choice as well in the middle of that is 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 tough because it's a double-edged sword. You know, why did you throw that offload? Um, because coach, I felt like it. That's where it was when it went to the floor and we lost. You know, you've got to then have some sort of consistency on how you deliver um, the feedback in relation to successful or negative outcomes. And and what that what that goes back into their heads, you know. Do you want to give them agency? As, as they that's how they describe it in academic terms. Do you want to give them autonomy, or just make them feel like they've got autonomy? So it's a sort of illusion, or is it is that genuine that they they feel they have autonomy on the field, off the field? No, they they, they have autonomy on the field for certain, and and obviously you instill that potentially in you know those key collaborators of of that group the four or five that probably go on the field and know your game and they're the ones that are able to pull the trigger when it when it when it's needed to to play with that freedom mm. and then just say simple you know two or three plays that bring us back to where we need to be um, the creativity bit of it is natural in Fiji collaborating to get creativity is not difficult because that's how they naturally go about things but it's then the ability to almost play with that but then have full attention and focus at critical moments in the game. Sevens is 14 minutes long, six and a half minutes of ball in play time. A player gets 45 seconds of influence. I mean that's that's hugely important that you're able to concentrate and make those good decisions. So, you know, we're taking them along the lines of becoming good decision makers. Not everybody's going to be doing that, but you certainly got to have leaders that can do that. And I think that the autonomy bit is 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 a behavioral system as well that exists in the culture of what what you've put in and the, the, there's a huge element to what we did remains Fijian and then there's this this element over here which is is the professional standards and behaviors and making those marry you know the pro you see on the field the product on the field is is the evolution of that and you know it caught us a few times you know again I said you're gonna be consistent as a coach that you treat you know the two offloads the same offload the same way one gets you a try one doesn't my predecessor used to say, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. It is a truism, certainly in, in rugby, but and certainly in Fijian rugby. But there's also, as you say, there's there's elements then that, you know, the behaviours on the field, are we recognise this scenario as being one where we've got to show focus and attention and, and not so much just about playing with freedom. Um, and that was the balance that was struck probably when we got to the Olympics. The other sort of theoretical area we want to touch on is this idea of orchestration, um, orchestrating a coaching environment. And we'd also want to touch on the idea of a, of creating a motivational climate and the right learning environment. So you've, you've mentioned a little bit about culture, but how important is that culture on and off the field? And how much is that down to you? And again, yeah, these ideas of religious differences and different approaches to timekeeping maybe, and uh, the fact that they like to have a lot of fun. So yeah, how do you orchestrate that coaching environment? Well, there's a huge element of, 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 of the whole process, but um, I think the biggest bit for me was probably being immersed in Fijian culture, 
from from the outset when I got there in sort of January 2017 and potentially looking back not having my family there at that stage was hugely important in me being able to understand where that all that all fitted where I fitted in that as well and 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 how I could combine that with what I felt was the avenue to to get performance um I think the orchestration of that um, is not just mine. It is very much around those people that I had around me, notably S and C coach who, who's 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 a preacher in himself, you know, a manager who who's a petty officer in the navy and comes from that military background. Um, the players themselves, their understanding and um, introducing them to you know concepts of of learning environments of of you know that there's there's a consistency certainly there's an emotional control that is required by me and a consistency in the way that I behave which is what is I what I'm looking for from them at some stage that's not to say they can't get emotional it's like, it's it's about in those crucial moments how, how do we behave and I, I also believe that in our orchestration there's models all over the place mm. I'm recognizing what my SNC coach is doing and I take a bit of that and that's how the players they get together and they talk then I'm going to take a bit of that and use that back and you you know, when when you start to see that, you can start nudging things in those directions. New people that came in to the environment, you know, um, likes of an assistant coach from Australia came in. And fortunately for me, he had a bit of time in the 15s environment in Fiji, and and it was second nature to him as well. And that 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 whole concept, that whole culture for Fijians is massively important because they are very community based. Um, you know, it's very probably possibly different. Probably goes back to almost when you think about mining communities in Wales, in you know, in in, in the middle to late 1900s, is that you know there's there's a social connection that happens, and replicating that in a sporting environment, and even you know one of the tricks I would use is village time. You've talked about you know the, 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 that that attention to detail in terms of getting timings right and being at meetings and things. You know that could be quite onerous on for GM boys after a while, and especially when you know you travel overseas, you wait for three weeks, and you've got timings here and there. So having what we build in village time, and Fijians are the best people in the world I've ever seen are doing absolutely nothing. And I mean, for four hours a day, they can do nothing. Just sit there and do nothing but just talk without a TV on, nothing, anything. And having you know appreciation of that enabled me to sort of punctuate what we were doing. And it is you're sort of building all of these little blocks in the week. You know, when do you come back together? What do they need? Um, the connection with the leadership group as well. I think that that, that orchestration, not just off the, on the field, but off the field as well, hugely important in being able to, um, you know, produce an environment where they felt safe, um, they could learn, uh, they were challenged. I mean, the challenge, one of the things with Fijian, they like to get comfortable because, you know, it's a good place to be. But ultimately, I'm there to disrupt the thinking as well. You know, I'm there to to take them outside comfort zone, like I'm doing, being in Fiji and trying to challenge myself w with what I've got to do. And you know, that was a reflection from me to them: is right. You know, what what are we going to do different? What is going to be the difference that makes a difference for us to go and and win a gold medal? So tell us, take us to the gold medal match, maybe the night before at the team hotel or the pre-match team talk. What you said at half time, in terms of motivation. What were those moments like, and how much thought did you give that speech pre World Cup final? What, what sort of things were you saying? What sort of messages? And what sort of buttons were you trying to press? I think I think one of the biggest things is and I, again with that consistency is is, is process is, is sticking to our process. Um, there is a rhythm that you get from playing tournaments over two or three days, um, and you know you can be. As a coach, you can be it can sometimes be a bit too aggressive in solving problems and, and getting on. What I've learned with Fijians is, you know, it, it, it is is less is more. Um, it's very much around conversations again, some footage that they'd watch potentially. But you know, you know, equally the motivational uh, elements that you're trying to tap into would be would be very much about family, um, faith uh, based, and the connection of those two sacrifice. Um, you know, when you get to to moments, I, you know, I remember going into the final. You know, we're playing New Zealand, which we've played numbers of times before. It was very low key. Um, 
you know, in the changing rooms, which is 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 lovely. And some coaches look at us and players, you know, the players are playing hymns before they go out and they're all singing and some are getting up and dancing. But that is the rhythm, that is the energy that they have and that's where they, they come together. I've done some work with a... Do mental. they know that intimidates other teams, that they look so no. calm? No, no. The perspe- perspective's not there. They, mm. they, they rather want other people to look at them as nice people. Um, and, 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 and loving people. And, and there is that, I say this now, there's a very much an element of the love in the room for each other and what they're going to go and do. They don't see, they don't see the opposition as enemy. They see them as a challenge for them personally. Mm-hmm. So they're not going over to, to put one over on New Zealand. They're going out there to see how good they can be and, and ultimately to do God's work is, is, is how that, that resonates with them. And I think that, you know, bef- before we went out in the final, it was as simple as, you know, the, the sacrifices mum and dad have made and community is made for you and how that's put you there. And there's a bit of visualisation in terms of getting them to, to, the, to the point where, you know, we, we've termed this, this, this phrase state junkies. You know, a Fijian, you get the critical mass in the right state and they're unstoppable. However, one or two of them not in that state and then it can implode. And, you know, the key sort of element of my coaching was to create this 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 environment around them where they felt safe, they felt challenged, but they felt they were learning and then ultimately they felt that they were, you know, had an up position to go and represent their country and represent their faith um, in, in those crucial moments. And, you know, the motivational bit, you know, is is ever there. You know, every you know, it's easy on an Olympic final. It's not so easy on a Tuesday morning when you've come back and you haven't won a tournament in Canada or whatever and the press is on you. So that's where the, the key moments are and the learning process of motivation and 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 and, and getting them to recognise that, that that sits at the forefront of why they do their job and, and, and what makes them special. And half time, just when you sort of you saying to the guys you've got this or you're trying to keep them level headed or you what sort of messages is it when they're just that close to a gold medal and you just want to control them a little bit or? Yeah, I mean, look, you get probably about 60 seconds. You know, if sevens is somewhat different to 15s than mm-hmm. that. You, 60 seconds to, to make a difference. So, you, you know, I, I've stuck to a few of them. You know, what are you doing well? Um, you know, creating a model in their head and they understand why they're in the position they're in. You know, what can we do in the second half to, to elevate that performance again? You know, so you might be pulling on something there which hasn't gone quite right and, you know, you get an answer and then, you know, really the immediacy of getting back in the moment is, is right. What is that next job? What are you going to go and do at this point? And, you know, after breathing and getting themselves in a position, they can accept this information. I'll step back out of that. And, and then the Fijian takes over. And that's where the spirituality and motivation, that's where the leaders come into the fore. And they get about 20 seconds and then, and then they're out. And, yeah, you know, that, that final, it, it was always tough, going to be tough against New Zealand. But... You know, we, we, I'd seen glimpses of what we could do over, you know, sort of three or four months, and I knew that the, the, the physicality was there. Um, it was it was pretty much around mentally. Were we going to be in a position that you know we were going to want to, you know, develop and leave everybody with understanding exactly what we could achieve? Have you been back to Fiji yet? No, I, I couldn't. I couldn't go back. There was lots of quarantining issues. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't seen my family for seven months, so. I came straight back from Tokyo and uh, came back to, I was hoping I'd go back, things might change, but they haven't, they're still, the borders, I think, uh, maybe in November. Um, but I, I, I'm going to have to get on with some other jobs in the meantime. Yeah. But yeah, that's one of the toughest things is I haven't been back to to thank people there who, who were you know instrumental in ensuring that, that, that we had that program that we needed to develop these boys and supported us and, um, you know, to say thank them personally that, of what they did. But um you know, at some stage, they, they all deserve that. I'm just pleased for the players and the, the staff, families, and the people who, who you know, put it in for us. Did you have messages from politicians and royalty? and? Yeah, yeah, the, you know, the PM and, uh, you know, the yeah, ambassadors across the world, that, you know, sort of when you go to every country, you'll meet the ambassador, the Fijian ambassador in America, Fijian ambassador in Japan. So so that that was very nice, you know. It is it is very much, as I say, part of, of the national identity, uh, as part of national pride, and, and I'm just pleased that, that that I was able to play a part in that and, and, and do that for them as a country. Congratulations. So the last question I'm going to ask is, um, obviously you're in charge of the 15s team this autumn. How big a switch is that for you as a coach? Um, we talk a lot about in rugby how sevens players don't always make great 15s players and it's not necessarily a pathway. For coaching, are you going to have to sort of totally switch your thinking from the last four years um, and your messaging 
and the players you select is that is that all going to be different this autumn? No, it won't be different. Um, you know, again, I have a a way that I believe works. Obviously, I'm not going to just cut and paste what I did there and put it in. I know that as it probably got from from the interview is that I'm I'm going to have to think on feet. I'm going to have to be in the moment with with the players. One of the things that I do get as an in is I know a number of them. Uh, I know the the Fijian culture. Uh, a lot of these boys now play up in European teams. Well, all of these boys play in European teams, and I think that um, you know, understanding that from my perspective with time with the Cardiff Blues and 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 what they would expect from coaching is important. And we go back to that that sort of role. Um, you know, I'm going to have to ensure that you know we as a, as a management coaching staff are, are there to support them. You know, the quality plays in themselves, and there's some quality staff members around us and coaches. And you know, really, what I'm I'm wanting to do is recreate that environment where they feel safe, that they can get on, keep learning, and 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 you know, put three performances in which show exactly what their potential is. For Fiji to beat Wales would be huge for Fiji as a team, but it'd be huge for you in your coaching career. So, what will that be like? Will you sing both anthems? Uh, what, how emotional do you think you might get before Fiji play Wales at the Principality Stadium, or are you the sort of coach? that doesn't really let emotion get to them. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm very emotional when it comes to certainly my my heritage as a Welshman but also you know what being in Fiji has meant to us as well as a family. So I'll sing both anthems for sure. Um, you know it's in my nature to do that. I don't mean anything by it that if people want to take something from that they can but you know ultimately it becomes you know once once it starts it becomes about the, the team I'm coaching against the other coach and you know, it is going to be pretty special for certain. Um, you know, I'm very grateful for uh, the powers that be in, in Fiji, you know, my chief executive and uh, high performance director and Vern Cotter as well, who's put this squad of coaches together that I'm in a position to do this. And, you know, there's not many that get this, this opportunity and, you know, it's ultimately it's the next challenge for me. Well, good luck this autumn. Good luck with Edinburgh afterwards and congratulations again for such an incredible uh, role in charge of Fijian and winning yourself a, a gold medal. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Cheers. Okay. Thanks.